All right, so we're continuing in this great study of the book of Hebrews. But before we dive into that, I wanted to share um, just briefly uh, about, you know, cultural differences in our world today. You know, culture matters, and uh, when you move or go to a different place, those of you guys, anybody Southeast Texas transplants, you know, you, you understand, right? Culture is different here in the Southeast Texas area than it might be from where you came from. Well, um, we just had a group come back from Guatemala a couple weeks ago, and I was reminded by some of the leadership of the team that we probably should discuss with each group that goes some of the differences that uh, are a part of culture. I'm like, okay, yeah. So I got to thinking a little bit about my experience there in Guatemala at San Raimundo, and I thought, oh, yeah, this is probably an important one to do. Um, and so every t- well, I got to go last year on a scouting trip and so they do like a dedication day the very last day that you're building the house you build the house and they gather the pastor together the missionary the entire team from praise and then like the family but also the family's friends neighbors and just the community come and gather there could be upwards of 50 or 60 or even more people that gather around this little job site this little bit 400 square foot house we pray over the house we're going to present a bible present the keys it's a really really big deal it's like the the crowning moment of the entire week where you really get to it's very emotional lots of tears well um, the time that I got to go, Justin Padilla was handing over a Bible and kind of saying some wonderful words. And, you know, you, you know this house is not just built on concrete. You know, da, da, da. he said it amazing. It was incredible. Made me cry. But in the midst of this moment that we're all having together, there's this sweet Guatemalan lady sitting, standing right next to me. I've never seen her before. She's from the community. And she's got a baby lashed on her hip. And then I see some movement happen. And then naturally I just look and it catches my eye. And sure enough, it was time to breastfeed. And shirt comes down, whoop, here we go, baby latches on. I make the most awkward uh, eye connection point ever I have had in my entire life as I look at that lady and I realize I should not be looking at you anymore. And I turn and I lock in on whatever Justin's saying. I'm like, don't look, don't look, this is uncomfortable. And it was that uncomfortable, yes. And apparently in other countries, this is normal. Maybe in your world it might be normal. It ain't normal in my world, okay? We cover it up, whatever it is. And so that was a, an unusual experience for me. Cultural differences, right? It might not be so appropriate here. Maybe it is. Might not be. Uh, but there in Guatemala City, or Guatemala, in San Raimundo, it was very, very normal. Maybe want a snack? I guess it's normal. We don't have cheese crackers. So moving on. So, uh, you know, it's... Cultural differences are pretty much evident everywhere. In Malaysia, here in States, we like to point when we need some. Hand me that book. Or would you give me that drink? That one's mine. That's my cup. Well, in Malaysia, it's rude to point with your fingers, so they point with their thumbs. It's kind of odd, right? I don't know how that's less rude, but it is less rude. It's appropriate. But in Nicaragua, they don't point at all, but with their lips. So try that for a second. How would you explain to the toddler... <laughs> And that's, that's growing up in your home to hand you that book. There. It's kind of funny to watch you try it as well. <laughs> Cultural differences. We point, they point. Very different. If you pointed this way, you would be considered rude. If they pointed with their lips here, we would think that they were blowing kisses at us, right? It's a very, very different experience. The Japanese, we teach our children to cut up your spaghetti noodles so you don't slurp. The Japanese are the opposite. You should enjoy slurping. So the next time, kids, that you're told don't slurp your noodles, just say, hey, we're just practicing Japanese culture when we eat our our noodles, right? Or how about this? In Middle Eastern countries, where are my left-handed people at? Pray for them, y'all. Life's like stacked against them from the beginning, right? I've got one of my kids is left-handed. My dad's left-handed. We didn't convert them. Somehow they got through because we're all trying to train you all to be right-handed people. You know that. And uh, some of you have a complex about it. Dane has one. That's my son. Left-handed people in the Middle East, it's considered inappropriate to use your left hand to eat because that's the hand they wipe with. So think about that next time you eat, left-handed person. (laughs) Or how about in China... Older people are not allowed to apologize to younger people. Now, I don't know about in your world, but in my world, I screw up so much, I have to apologize to my children constantly. So that would not work in my household at all. But even within the U.S., as we talked about those transplants, what's common in the South might not be so common in the North. In smaller cities, it might be more appropriate to open the door for someone when they walk into a restaurant. You know, if you don't do that here in Southeast Texas, you're considered... 
Yes, you are. And we will make sure we give you a look when we walk in the restaurant after you. So you better remember that. And that means I get to cut in front of you too. Yes, I know it's a weird thing, but that's how it goes. Or how about this? When you walk into, you're, you're passing somebody, you should always greet them with a hello, how you doing, you know, a head nod, a handshake. But think if you were in New York City on the busy streets there on the sidewalks, you would never make it a city block if you were having to greet every single person that you walk by. And so our culture, even in the States, is very different one to another. You might require your family members to take off their shoes when they walk into your house. Or we might sit at the table when we eat, but others might sit in the living room where they eat. It might not be okay to eat in certain rooms. Other places, it's okay to eat anywhere. We, our cultures and our homes are even very different. And understanding those cultural differences, that context in which a person lives, is incredibly important to understand why people say what they say, why they do what they do, why they respond the way that they respond. In the book of Hebrews, as we're going back to that, this is our fifth week in the book of Hebrews. The book of, book of Hebrews was not written to 21st century Texans, if you didn't know. I'm just going to put that out there. It was written to second generation Hebrew Christians who had converted to the faith from Judaism. And they most likely underwent fierce persecution by both the Jews and the Romans, who they were under the influence of and under the control of. And so three words that sum up this entire book of Hebrews are this. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Within each chapter, the author is comparing Jewish religious practices, uh, traditions, beliefs with the supremacy of Christ. Because what we believe is, is that Christ fulfilled the law... And now we follow Christ under a new covenant, the covenant of grace. We don't have to follow the law of Moses anymore. I don't know when the last time you sacrificed a bull before you came into church. Hopefully it wasn't this morning. Right? But that wouldn't be appropriate anymore. We don't have to do that to connect with God. Why? Because Jesus is better. We recognize that as commonplace today. But in their world... It would have been something that they were being persecuted by the Jewish people with, saying, you know, you're not following the religious practices of today. You're not a good Jewish person. They're like, yeah, I, I'm a Jew, but I also follow Jesus. I'm a Messianic Jew. I follow Christ. And they, that's not good enough. And so they'd be persecuted by them. They'd be persecuted by the Romans as well. Life was not good for second generation Hebrew Christians who had converted to the faith from Judaism during this time where the author of Hebrews was writing this book. He wasn't writing to us. So for us to truly grasp the meaning of the passages of Scripture, we have got to understand ultimately why some people point with their lips instead of their fingers. We need to understand their culture of how they lived and what they believed for us to really allow this to be able to sink in as we read the book of Hebrews. You guys with me? All right, here we go. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 4. If you got your journal, let me see it. Yeah? All right, very good. If you got your Bible app, Praise Church app, open and ready to rock and roll. Let me see it. Okay, all right. If you're just happy to be here, let me see you. Hey, all right. And they, they win, that's for sure. That's right, I'll be right there with you. All right, so uh, we're going to read Hebrews. Everything's going to be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. We're going to read a lot of scripture. And if you remember anything, just remember what's on the screen. That's the best thing you're going to hear today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, that great high priest, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. No, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are tempted, yet Jesus did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Then he's talking about the high priest of, of their time, not Jesus the great high priest. Chapter 5, verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself, the high priest, is subject to weakness too. That is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes that honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Put a pin in that. We'll come back to Aaron. 
Verse 5, in the same way that Aaron was called by God, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him. And now these next two passages, this next two verses are going to be verses that are found in the book of Psalms. The first one, you are my son, today I become your father, is found in Psalm chapter 2. The next one, you are a priest forever in the order of Mel Melchizedek. Put a pin in that. We'll go back to that guy. In the order of Melchizedek, that's found in Psalm 110. Now, there are 15 chapters in the book of Psalms that are considered messianic psalms, which means they are foretelling the coming Messiah. They are talking about Jesus from the Old Testament, telling us what Jesus is going to be like. Psalms chapter 2 and Psalm 110 are two of those chapters. And so what the author of Hebrews is stating is, is he's saying, hey, these, these Jewish Christians would know these scriptures. They would understand exactly Psalm 2, that's a messianic prophecy. Psalm 110, oh yeah, absolutely. I know exactly what that's talking about. They would know. We wouldn't. When I read Psalm 2, I have no idea what it's talking about. I have to go read the, you know, the paragraphs of footnotes to help me to be able to allow it to soak in a little bit. They would be all too familiar with the coming Messiah and what he was to be like. So when he points to this, what he's saying is, is that Jesus follows in that order of this guy named Melchizedek, which we'll come back to. So let's continue into verse 7. The author of Hebrews continues, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Think about Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When he prayed, you know, asking God to take, take away what was coming his way. But he ultimately said, God, I'm going to submit and follow your will. And he was heard because of his reverent submission to the will of God. Verse 8, son, though he was, Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, or in other words, once he completed his work on earth, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is going to be a little meaty, but we have to make sure. If we want to try to get a picture of who Jesus is, God is the one who created the sacrificial system. God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai and said, we're going to set up all of this in this order. And so when the author of Hebrews is relating back to that, he's helping people to understand just who Jesus is. And for us, it's just as important because we've been now grafted into the family of God, the people of God. And so that's our family heritage as well. That's our family lineage. That's how it used to go for the believers, the people who believed in God. And so it's important for us to grasp that because that's how God chose to reveal his son Jesus as the great high priest. So it would cheapen grace to us if we didn't fully understand the measure or the impact of what the high priest's role was in the sacrificial system way back when in the law of Moses. So that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. So the office of high priest, it was instituted at Mount Sinai when God gave the law to the Israelites through Moses. Moses' brother was Aaron, older brother, and his descendants were chosen to be priests who were responsible for interceding for Israel before God. The priesthood was hereditary. It was passed down through the line of Levi. It was the Levitical priesthood. Inside the tribe of Levi, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Inside the tribe of Levi was the family of Aaron. And the family of Aaron would produce the high priest for all time. Until Jesus would come. That was the Levitical priesthood. And they weren't given a plot of land like the other tribes of Israel. They were given the church to take care of. That's what the Levites were, were given the opportunity to do. That was their inheritance, was the church. And so the high priest was the supreme religious leader of the Israelites. I guess it could kind of be like the Pope among Catholics today. They were the supreme religious leader. So was Jesus a descendant of the tribe of Levi? Was he? Yes, no? Do we know? It's a 50-50 shot. No? All right, I had to find this out. So you, you're way off better than me or you're a better guesser. No, he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. What tribe was he from? All right. You guys are sharp. We should switch places right now. You already know more. I had to learn all of this stuff. So he's from the tribe of Judah, right? He's from the tribe of Judah. So when the author of Hebrews is talking this over with the Hebrew Christians, it's, this could be a point of contention, right? Jesus can't be the high priest. 
Because he's not from the tribe of Levi. Well, in steps this conversation about Melchizedek. Remember we said we're going to put a pin in that? Okay, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 7 and we're going to read a good bit of scripture. So yes, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. But in chapter 7, we're going to read a little bit of scripture. Verse 1. The author of Hebrews says, This Melchizedek that grace, was king of Salem and he was a priest. He was priest of God Most High. He met Abraham. Now, if you know about the timeline, there was Moses, but way before Moses, there was Abraham. Right? And Abraham was given all the promises of God. You know, your inheritance will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shores. Right? And out of your, fa- out of your family line will come one who is going to be a blessing to all nations. And we now understand that to be Jesus. Right? But he didn't know that it was going to be Jesus at the time. But as we're be able to look back, we can see that. Well, Abraham preceded Moses. All right? So that's important for us to know. But Melchizedek was alive when Abraham was alive. He met Abraham returning from defeat of the kings. From the defeat of the kings, he won this big war. And Melchizedek, priest of God most high, blessed Abraham. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. A tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness, right living with God. Then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. So Melchizedek meant king of righteousness and peace. In verse 3, this is what scripture says. Without father or mother... Without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he, Melchizedek, remains a priest forever. Now this is important. Two things about, uh, let's talk about this. Melchizedek, kind of a mysterious character in Scripture. It's found back in the book of Genesis. It's telling, I think it's Genesis 14. Don't quote me on that. You can Google it. But Genesis is this encounter with Abraham. And Melchizedek, People, scholars believe maybe one of two theories that I would kind of agree with. Not that I'm a scholar. There's a bunch more other theories. But one of them is, is that Melchizedek was kind of like a Christ-like figure. One that would kind of foreshadow what Christ would be like. And that would kind of help us to be able to see what Christ is, who Jesus is going to be today. And so it wasn't Jesus himself, but it was a Christ-like figure that would represent Christ to us. Like Moses uh, on the top of Mount Sinai when he prayed and asked God to forgive people of their sins, the Israelites of their sins, when God was ready to destroy them. Like we look at that as Moses was a mediator between people and God. And we say Moses was Christ-like in that nature. And we can look to Moses and see that Christ is going to be this kind of person who's a mediator between God and man, right? So we can look at maybe Melchizedek in the same way. That's one view. Another view is that Melchizedek was actually Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, that shouldn't surprise us too much because we believe that Jesus is eternal, existing for all time. Always was, always is, and is to come. When God said, let us make man in our own image, God the Father was communing with God the Son and God the Spirit. And they were agreeing that they were going to make man in his image. And before God created the heavens and the earth, Jesus was. And always, always was, always is, and always will be. So it's entirely possible, but before Jesus was born in the book of Matthew, that he would have appeared to Abraham in the Old Testament. And maybe the author of Hebrews gives credit to that, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. And any time, I learned this word for this sermon to sound really smart. Uh, Any time that Jesus appears in the Old Testament, because people believe that he appeared many times in the Old Testament, it's called a Christophany. Am I right by that? Is anybody? Okay, we're going to go with that. A Christophany is Christ's appearance in the Old Testament before his birth in, in the book of Matthew. And so maybe Melchizedek was Jesus himself, but ultimately the author of Hebrews is not necessarily trying to define who Melchizedek was, but in the importance of who Melchizedek was in comparison to Abraham. We, we know that because in verse 4, the author of Hebrews says, Just think how great Melchizedek was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, the guy at the top of the mountain, he's Father Abraham. He even knelt before Melchizedek and gave him a tenth of the plunder. And now we know in our day in the law of Moses that the author of Hebrews would say, He would say, the law requires the descendants of Levi, who have become priests, to collect a tenth from the Israelite people, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi. Why? Because he was alive before the Levitical priesthood was set up. 
And so, I'm sorry, lost my spot. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So he's saying, hey, Melchizedek is even greater than Abraham. And in verse 11, if we continue on uh, just in chapter 7, it says, Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, through the law, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Why couldn't someone have come through the Levitical priesthood that would fulfill the law and give grace and satisfy the law Well, it wasn't possible. So someone outside of that had to come to be able to do that, to arise after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if we can think back once again to that Psalm 110 passage of Scripture that related to back in Hebrews 5. It says, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What they're saying is is the Messiah is not going to come from the Levitical priesthood. It's going to come from Melchizedek's priesthood. One that both preceded the Levitical priesthood and superseded it. In Jesus Christ. So when Jesus came, the Levitical priesthood ended. There was no need for a priest anymore to go on our behalf to mediate between us and God. Why? Because Jesus is better. He came and fulfilled the law and the prophets so that now we don't have to work through an intermediary between us and God. We have Jesus that does that for us on our behalf. In verse 12, we see evidence of that. The author of Hebrews says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, going from the Levitical priesthood now to Jesus being the great high priest, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Remember, we had the law of Moses, but now we operate under the covenant of grace, right? The covenant of grace. Once again, we don't have to you know, slaughter animals and make sacrifices and go to a priest on our behalf to be able to intercede between us and God. We can just pray and seek forgiveness from our sins. We can pray in our time of need, and God will hear and respond to us, right? We have the covenant of grace now. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, not the tribe of Levi, from which no one has ever served at the altar. It's the tribe of Judah. Verse 15. This becomes even more evident when that priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of family lineage, but by the power of an indestructible life. What indestructible life? Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. It's an indestructible life. So when we think about Melchizedek, when we think about Jesus, Jesus is the great high priest, not coming from the Levitical priesthood, but coming from this order of Melchizedek. Whatever he was, a Christ-like figure, that pointed to the coming Messiah. In the Psalms that pointed to the coming Messiah, they knew this scripture and they would understand that what the author of Hebrews is saying is, is we don't need the priesthood of Levites anymore because we have Jesus. And Jesus is better. So the high priest... They did serve as mediators between humans and God. Jesus now serves as mediator between us and God. He understands God's power and his perfection. He was sinless. And he also stands, understands our weakness. If you think about it, that's what Hebrews was saying in uh, chapter or whatever. 14, right? Or chapter 4, verse 14. He was saying, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. No, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was able to conquer sin without giving in to temptation. If you think about it this way, um, who would probably understand the power and the pressure of temptation more? Would it be the person who is tempted and gives in to sin immediately? They would understand something of temptation, yes, But how much more so Jesus, who lived a life in its entirety and never once gave in to the temptation of sin. He would understand even better the weight and the power and the pressure of temptation to sin on a person's life, having never given in. And Jesus then fully understands, even to a greater magnitude, our weakness, but also God's perfection. He is the perfect and only person that would be be able to mediate between us and God. In the way that he does. So Jesus fills the role of mediator. And not just once a year. You have to understand. um, The high priest in the Levitical priesthood. During the law of Moses. The high priest. Their most important duty. Was to conduct the service on the day of atonement. The tenth day of the seventh month of the year. Only 
On that day was he allowed the high priest to enter the most holy place, the holy of holies, where the presence of God dwelt. This is how God set it up. God set up in such a way that he would dwell in the presence of his people, but did not dwell in the hearts of people. Because Christ had not come to take away the sin of the world. So this temporary solution that God put in place in the law of Moses and the Levitical priesthood allowed God to commune with man. Lived in the, people lived around the presence of God. And one day a year, one person in the whole world could enter in and experience the presence of God in the holy of holies. Now having made a sacrifice for himself first... And then for the people, he would bring the blood into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant. It was God's throne. He did this to make atonement for himself and the people for all of their sins committed during the year that just ended. And then the next year, on the 10th day of the seventh month, the high priest would go in and do it again. And the next year, and they did this for thousands of years. And in this way, we see the presence and the power of God most plainly. If you think about it this way, we know that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. His death on the cross did something incredible in the most visible, tangible way that God could describe to the people that understood the separation of the curtain, uh, the most holy of holies, this thing that kept God's presence on one side and man's sinfulness on the other. When Jesus died on the cross, Matthew 27, verse 51 says this, At that moment, at Jesus' death on the cross, the curtain of the temple that separated man from the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, it was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. In essence, it was God's way of releasing the presence and the power of God through the Holy Spirit into the hearts and the minds of believers. Before then, if you wanted to experience the presence of God, you got to go to, to Jerusalem, to the temple as close as you could to pray and seek God. And you couldn't speak to God except through, right, except through a high priest that would go on behalf of you to be able to forgive you of your sins. But when Jesus came, he tore that system open and allowed the presence of God to spill out. And in Acts chapter 1, we understand how the Holy Spirit descended upon believers after Jesus' resurrection from the grave and his ascension into heaven. And in that way, Jesus is both the sacrifice, and the high priest. You see, he does mediate for us. In fact, Scripture says, where is Jesus now? Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and 34. says, Paul says, who should bring any charge against God's chosen people? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It's Christ Jesus. He's the one who died. And more than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God right now. Who indeed is interceding for us. He is acting as our intercessor right now. And so now, what we have the opportunity to do, as Jesus as our high priest, as our mediator, we don't have to go to church to experience the closeness and the presence of God. Now, Scripture calls us a temple of the living God. We are a living temple. The Holy Spirit now lives within us. The presence of God dwells within us as believers. And in 1 Peter, he would say it this way. He would say, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are now called a priesthood. We are the caretakers of the church. We are the intercessors, the mediators between a sinful people and and God. We help draw people to Jesus Christ. That's what we get to do. We are God's special possession. Why? He answers it in verse 9. So that you and I may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into the wonderful light of Jesus. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. You see, now as followers of Jesus, we get to experience the presence of God everywhere we go. In our lowest moments when we're lonely. That's why you cry out to God and you feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You've been there, haven't you? 
Or when you experience great loss in your life and you're surrounded by believers who are praying for you and who are encouraging you and who are pointing you to Christ, you feel the love of Christ and somehow, some way, in the midst of great loss or in pain or in suffering, suffering, you feel joy. It's unexplainable. It doesn't make sense to the lost world around you, but it makes perfect sense to you. You might say it like this, I don't know why, I can't explain it, but I just have this joy welling up inside me. That I just trust that God's got it. He's going to make it okay. I believe. God gives us faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. When all seems lost, we get to experience the closeness and the connection of God because Jesus is the great high priest. He is in heaven now interceding for us. Not one time a year on July 10th, but every moment of every day, he is interceding for us on our behalf. So that when I sin... Jesus says, hey, God, I covered that sin. Like last Friday when I might have got road range and might have told somebody they were number one. Not really, but I thought it. Definitely thought it. You know, when they honked at me unnecessarily. Unnecessarily, I tell you. (laughs) I'm working through it. God says, Jesus says, hey, God, I, I took care of that sin. When I flip out and lose my cool with my children. God says, Hey, what about that sin? Jesus says, I covered that one too. So I have uninterrupted connection between God the Father and myself, my sinful, broken heart. Scripture says that I can boldly approach the throne of grace. I don't have to be afraid of what God's going to do to me because I've sinned so much or I've messed up so much in my life, but I can boldly approach the throne of grace. What a joy that is to know. I want to close with a couple of readings from a book that I finished. It's on my read every year list. Do y'all have a list like that? It's like a read, you know, a list of books that you're going to read every year because they're so good. This is on there. Okay, you should add it to yours too. It's about a man named Samuel Lamb. He's a pastor in a church in China. And uh, during Chinese communism, when it really took root, they were trying to establish the three self you know, movement and uh, the, you know, the Chinese church and try to root out all Christianity and institute atheism as their, their beliefs. It's what they still believe today. Samuel Lamb was a pastor who was told to renounce his faith. When he chose not to, they sent him to a prison camp. And he spent 21 years of his life in a prison camp. And in the worst of the prison camps, he was mining coal And this is what um, this author um, works with Pastor Samuel Lamb to recount his story and his experience. And in one of these prison camps, mining coal, some 15 years into his 21-year prison camp sentence for not renouncing his faith in Jesus as Savior and leader of his life, this is what scriptures, or what, what he says. Samuel Lamb says, I became more vividly aware of the presence of God. And although I'd copied pages of Scripture, they had been confiscated. Those long hours of copying had functioned as a refresher course in the New Testament. Clear in my mind were the pain and and sufferings of Jesus. When an avalanche of ore fell on my head and shoulders, I thought of Stephen being stoned. When lights failed on another occasion and it was complete darkness, I thought about the blind man and the great physician's touch that brought him from utter darkness into glorious light. During those years of China's greatest troubles, the coal mines of Shangzi lay a world apart from Samuel's family in Guangzhou. I think I said that right. Family visits were neither possible nor allowed. Mail arrived sparingly. The depths of the coal mine became a taunting symbol of the dip distance separating Pastor Lamb from his wife and from his family. But the presence of God remained. In retrospect, Pastor Lamb says, The Lord sustained me in a way that I could have known only through experience. I now, in fullest sincerity, thank him for that experience. I never knew a day when I was unaware of his love and mercy. Never a time when I doubted or despaired. I knew my Lord was with me. I sensed my guardian angel ever at my side. The presence of God assured him that the eternal God is our refuge and strength. 15 years in a prison camp. Couldn't go to church. Would have been beaten and killed on site for witnessing if he ever got caught. 
he probably won more people to the Lord in that prison camp than I probably ever will in my lifetime. Experience the presence of God in that remote place, in the tunnel of a coal mine, in a prison camp in China, because Jesus is better. He is the great high priest, unleashing the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit into his life, into your life, into my life. Not so that we can just enjoy being God's chosen people, but no, as Peter would say, so that we can join in the royal priesthood, declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is what he goes on to say, or what is said about him. Samuel, Pastor Samuel Lamb, he encouraged all Christians to practice this priesthood of believers, to preach the word, not only from pulpits, but also from the pew, the factory, the marketplace, and the streets. He said, when you know you are saved, you must bring the gospel to those who you know are not saved. It was a simple formula, and it worked. For example, one young man in Samuel's congregation worked in a factory of 100 men at the time of his com- conversion. When the other workers learned of the young man's conversion, they made fun of him, causing him problems in his work. The young man said nothing. He knew his adversaries were waiting for him to preach so they could report him to the authorities. He simply lived his testimony. He combated ridicule with smiles. If a fellow employee needed help, he gave it. To someone in need, he quietly demonstrated compassion. Little by little, the young man effectively represented his Lord, who through his people spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the sweet aroma of Christ. Soon, factory workers began coming to the young Christian for help. Cautiously, he shared his faith and invited his co-workers to attend services at their church. And as a result, more than one-third of those factory workers experienced salvation in Jesus Christ. Friends, that's in China, where then one mention of the name of Jesus and you'd be thrown into a prison camp. How much more do we have the opportunity to go out into our world Not be content with just bringing our friends and our lost folks that we know to church, hoping that Pastor Reg will say the right thing and something will hit right. We're missing it. You are the sweet aroma of Jesus Christ. The fragrance that fills every room that you go into at work and at home. If you want your people to experience the goodness and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, if you want them to be saved, friend, look in the mirror. You are the example of Christ. You are the aroma of Christ through the life that you live, the example that you live out before them, and through the timely word and the right mention of the name of Christ, your friends and your family and your coworkers will be saved. Our goal is not to gather as many people into a room and then charge them up and send them out. It's to empower you in this room to go out and build a church so big that they won't fit in this room. It is not about praise church. It is about your lost people in your life coming to salvation. And it is your opportunity. How could Pastor Lamb be thankful for 21 years of prison sentence for not renouncing the name of Jesus? Because he knew that was the only way some of those people would ever experience the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. Now that is crazy living. I don't have that kind of faith. But I do believe that God's called me to my home and to my work and to represent Jesus Christ in such a way that I would join the priesthood of believers declaring the works of the one who has called me out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Amen? Amen. We're going to close with a song of worship. I want to pray over us. And then I'm going to invite you to stand and sing and just respond. Not sing. Respond to the character and action of God, that Jesus is the great great high priest. Thankful that we do get to worship him in spirit and in truth. We get to know him personally, that he is with us in our deepest and darkest moments. And he has saved us, not just to be saved, but so that we may go into all the world and make disciples in our homes, in our workplaces, in our factories, in our marketplaces, to be able to make a difference, sharing the good news of Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Thank you for your peace and grace and mercy in our lives. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for hope. Thank you for joy. 
God, I pray that we would be a people that are rooted in Christ in such a way that people around us can join under the shade tree of our life and enjoy the fruit of right living. They can enjoy peace and goodness that they see in our life, mercy and hope and faith and justice and kindness and goodness. God, that they will show, so enjoy the shade from the harshness of the world that they will wonder what is it that produces this good works in you and that we will be able to point their eyes heavenward to Jesus Christ who has called us out of darkness and into his wonderful, marvelous light. Jesus, you are better. And we respond in worship to that knowledge today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's stand together and worship one more time.